Amen. Well, good morning. Good to be with you guys this morning. Lots going on, man. Hope you guys are able to get involved in those things. You know, take those things seriously. They come and go quickly. So, um, as we continue into the Advent season this morning, I, I kind of want to go back and rehearse a few of the things that Ryan said because they are so important that I want to be sure that you don't miss them and repetition is the mother of learning, okay? So, one of the things that he said is Christmas and Advent are two different things. Now, they're connected, obviously. But they're not the same thing, which can be a little bit confusing because if you were here with us last week and now you're here this, this morning, I, I mean, you know, we're decorated for Christmas, guys. Like, I mean, these are not Advent trees. These are Christmas trees. These are not Advent lights. They're Christmas lights. That is a table that has Advent candles, but it's all gesturing toward, it's all building up to Christmas. Christmas is the day of the year, year upon year, in which Christians all over the world enter into intentionally and viscerally and then celebrate the reality that our God is not a distant God. He's not a faraway God. He's not a God who's, you know, locked away in some place called heaven, disconnected from the realities of this world and all of its darkness and from all of my realities and darkness or yours. But instead, he's a God who breaks through. He's a God who breaks through into this world. He's a God who breaks through into my life, into your life, into lives of anyone who will have him. Like, he is a breakthrough God, and we know that for a fact, because through a supernatural conception, the invisible God became visible. The incomprehensible God became as comprehensible as he possibly could. The one who was intangible to us came as a baby that you could hold, that you could touch, that on Christmas, he stepped into this world as one of us to change this world, and in the end, dispel its darkness entirely. And in between then and now, to change whoever will surrender their darkness to Him, will give their lives to Him, invite Him to, to enter in with His light. And so, as Ryan said, Advent is really, and it's a little surprising if you don't understand these categories, like Advent is a season of darkness. It's a season in which we enter intentionally, prayerfully, carefully, into the darkness of this world and even into the darkness of our own personal lives. But we do not enter into the darkness to embrace the darkness and make friends with it. We don't enter into the darkness to celebrate it. We don't enter into the darkness to succumb to it, to be overwhelmed by it, to be overcome by it, to sit down in the midst of it and go, well, everything's dark and there's nothing I can do about it. Which, by the way, is true, isn't it? We enter into the darkness that we might feel the desperation of the reality that we are not an answer for ourselves, that education hasn't done it, that politics have not done it, that technology has not done it, that nothing that we do left on our own is going to do it. And we get to the place where with the prophet Isaiah, we cry out the prayer that I read to you, which is, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down because you alone are our only hope. It's doom or it's deliverance. And we do it knowing that we're moving toward the reality of Christmas, which is that God is a delivering breakthrough kind of God. And that the God who was promised to come came in the person of Jesus Christ. And we celebrate him at Christmas. But that same God who has come once has promised to come yet again. And in between then and now, he promises to enter into the lives of anyone who will have him. He is the light of the world, guys. And here's what we know about the light of the world that we belong to through faith. We know that there is no darkness that can or that will ever overcome him. So we enter into the darkness to stare it down, to shake our fist in its face and say, hey, you know what? You lose. You do not win. So we're going to do that this year through the lens of the lives of some of the women who find themselves in the family tree of Jesus, in the lineage of the line of Christ. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at the darkness in their lives and seek that the best that we can from a few thousand years away to try to enter into what it was that they must have experienced, to how they felt, to, to the way they would have been wounded, to the way they would have been seen, to the things that they would have had to deal with and experience in their lives. Okay, that's part of it. And we're entering into those things, not just so that we can go, okay, well, look at you. You know, I'm, I feel really bad for you. This stinks for you, but so that we can realize that human nature never changes and that actually we can, separated by a few thousand years, really easily identify with their darkness, and we're going to look for the same darkness in us. Oh, wait a minute. She was experiencing this? I've kind of experienced something 
along those lines. Wait a minute, she was feeling this? She was wounded like this? I felt that. I have that wound. I, I, I. Because here's the thing with each one of these women. There's darkness and there's light. And their stories invite you into the light. It's a dark, dispelling light. And so we're going to begin today with Leah. And if you're familiar with the story of Leah, then you know that it's completely and totally intertwined with the story of her husband Jacob and with the story of her father Laban and with the story of her sister Rachel and then with all of the kids that they have. Like, it is a really long story in the Bible, and so I am not going to read it to you, okay? I'm going to commend it to your reading, starting in about Genesis 25 with the birth of her husband, because you've got to get him to get her. But I'm mostly just going to tell it to you today, and I'll, I'll read a little bit here and there. Um, to kind of fill it in. And I want to begin with her husband. Uh, There is no way to understand Leah apart from her husband. His name was Jacob. And the first thing that I want you to know about Jacob is that he was perfectly named. So Jacob means deceiver. It means supplanter. It means one who grabs or one who grasps at things that do not belong to him. That's him, guys. And it is him literally from the moment of his birth. He is a twin. He's the younger twin of Esau, both of which are the sons of Isaac and Rebekah. So he's the younger twin, meaning he's born right after his twin brother is born. But as his twin brother is being removed from the womb, where is Jacob? He's holding on to the foot of Esau as if to say, no, 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 not him. Not him, me. I want to be the firstborn. Why? Oh, because there was status there. Firstborn mattered big. The firstborn son in that culture, that day, that age, received the birthright. What is the birthright? It was the conference of the leadership of the family, and in a case with two brothers, it would have been 100% of the estate of their father. Their father was as wealthy as a king. Big deal. I want to lead the family. I want to run the show. I want to own it all. I want the birthright. The firstborn would have also received the blessing. We're talking about the patriarchal blessing within the covenant family of God. Abraham confers this blessing on Isaac, which is their father, who's going to confirm it upon Esau? Well, that's the plan. That's certainly Isaac's plan. That's not Jacob's plan. He's the deceiver. He's the supplanter. He's the grabber. He's the grasper. And so what does he do? Because he wants these things. He waits. He waits for the perfect vulnerability, this perfect opportunity with his brother, and he gets his brother, let's use the word, he swindles his brother into trading him the birthright, the whole estate, the leadership, the whole deal for a bowl of stew. In a court of law today, that would be overturned, okay? It would not fly, but it flew then. Jacob gets the birthright for a bowl of stew but he doesn't have the blessing yet. So how does he get that? Because he does. He hears that his father is going to confer that blessing upon his brother Esau, and he knows that his father, who is old and elderly and is blind, so he's living in darkness. That's kind of a key idea today, darkness. His father is living in the darkness of blindness, and he sneaks in, and he persuades his father that he is, is Esau, and so thinking that he is Esau, Isaac, their father, confers the blessing on Jacob instead of Esau. At which point, they have a little family meeting, mom and dad, with just Jacob, and they say, look, you've got to get out of here, and the reason you need to get out of here, there are two. One, your brother is determined to kill you, and it's not hard to understand why. It's not right, but he is really ticked. And secondly, you're the next patriarch in the line. So it's not going to be Abraham, Isaac, Esau. It's going to be Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And you need to marry the right woman. And you're not going to be able to find her here in the land of Canaan. And the reason for that is because the Canaanite women kept their gods as they enter into marriage. They didn't put them aside in light of the God of their husband. And so we can't have that in the covenant family of God. So we're going to do for you, Jacob, what my dad did for me, Isaac. We're going to send you to your mom's family. And you, from your uncle Laban, your mother's brother, are going to marry one of his daughters. And so off he goes. And he shows up at uncle Laban's house for the express purpose of finding a bride. 
Laban has two daughters, Leah, who we're looking at, and then the younger daughter is Rachel. And guys, Leah is the obvious choice. And the reason she's the obvious choice is that by custom and convention, all of the fathers in this part of the world married off their oldest first. They would marry them off in the order of their birth, which, as you understand, would create some protection for these girls, would it not? Because I don't want to, you know, what if, I'm, if it's a smorgasbord and I get to choose, I'm going to, no, it's not. It goes this person and then this person and then, the, you get it? And I have two daughters. Leah's the obvious choice. But here's the problem. Jacob can only love something or someone who is beautiful. And she may be beautiful on the inside, and I think she is. But on the outside, she pales in comparison to her younger sister. I just feel that for a second. I just want to give this girl a hug, man. Jacob can only love that which is beautiful. And after seeing Rachel... He wants nothing whatsoever to do with Leah. And in fact, Leah becomes an impediment to him. She becomes an obstacle. She becomes something or someone that he has to negotiate a way around to get what he really wants. For Jacob, there are no rules that can't be broken, at least for him. You get the idea? And since we're trying to enter into her darkness, I want you to feel the weight of that for a second. Because, I mean, here's Leah, and she is waiting to be married. That was a really big deal in that culture. Very different culture from ours, but there was everything attached to it. And apparently, she had no suitors. Month after month, year after year, which is odd, isn't it? She's part of a very prominent family, a very wealthy family, a very influential family. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this guy, Jacob, shows up, and he's one of her kinsmen, and I understand he's a first cousin, but, you know, that was not weird for them back then, okay? That actually kind of pre-qualifies him for marriage. It's like, oh my goodness, this is, this is one of our own kins. This is part of our own family, of, of course. I mean, this would be fantastic, and let's give Jacob a little credit. Jacob is incredibly bright. Jacob is incredibly talented. Jacob is incredibly creative. Jacob is a physically powerful guy. I mean, you find this in other parts of his story where you go, oh my goodness, this guy's like, he's a mule, man. I mean, he is strong. He's probably good looking. He has the birthright meaning the whole estate and the leadership of it, which is like unto a king, and he has the blessing. The favor of the Lord, which is evident, is upon him. Almost everything he touches turns to gold. So it's like Prince Charming shows up at your door, and everyone in your family, and all of your friends, and everybody in the household, a whole community is going, <laughs> This is your lucky day, including you, because you're the oldest. So you're the obvious choice until you're not. Until Prince Charming sees your sister and says, nope, I want her. Ouch. That is a publicly humiliating moment. Something the whole community gets to talk to. So here's what happens. This brilliant, capable, nevertheless deceptive and selfish man goes to Laban, the father of Leah and Rachel, and says, listen, here's the thing. I want to swing a deal for the hand of your daughter, Rachel. Just want to be clear on this. Not Leah. I want Rachel. And here's what I'm willing to offer you. I have the blessing, and it's evident of the Lord upon me. I'm bright and capable and all of that. I mean, I don't mean to brag, but I'm sort of a thing. And so here's the deal. I am offering you the full value of my services completely for your profits, not for one year, not for two years, not for three, four, five, or even six years. I will work seven years for you, enriching you. So like, build some storehouses, bud, because it's coming for you. If you'll give me Rachel instead of Leah, meaning you'll violate the customs and conventions of the land. And what Jacob does not know in this moment is that his father-in-law is more deceptive than he is, even more crafty. So Laban answers him in a way that 
makes it seem as if he's saying, yeah, we'll do that. that. That sounds like a good plan. Get to work. I'll give you Rachel. I'm a hard yes on this. But really, when you look at it carefully, you realize, no, 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 it's not exactly what he says. Like, I mean, if this is a you know, contract, there's a lot of footnotes, okay? And it's all in invisible ink. Like, this man leaves his options open is the idea. But Jacob thinks it's a done deal, so he sets to work. And he works hard for seven years enriching his future father-in-law until the day for the wedding finally comes. And it's a wedding feast that would last a whole week, first day, First night, consummation of the marriage. Feasting, banqueting, having fun, festivities for the rest of the time. And just when the bride and groom are to head off to the hotel, Laban steps in behind the scenes. Rachel, come over here. You're coming with me. Leah, come over here. Very helpful for you to be dressed exactly like your sister. Grateful that you each have worn a veil all day long. I'm sending you to the hotel with Jacob. And in the morning, you, not Rachel, will be his bride. And under the darkness, hear the word, and no doubt under the influence of wine, I think that's a fair assessment with the help of veils and no electricity in this world of dark, Jacob thinks he's married Rachel. But actually, he's now married to Leah. And he wakes up the next morning, and he is none too happy about it. Like, he goes to his father-in-law, and he says something like, what the heck? You know, like, what, are you, what have you done to me? Like, what, what is happening here? And Laban's like, whoa, 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 hang on a second. Apparently, you didn't read the fine print because I never said that that's what I was agreeing to. I said, eventually, maybe, kind of, sort of, you'll end up with her. And I'm planning, by the way, to still keep that. But I am a prominent man in this community. This community has rules and ethics by which we live. And here's the reality that I have to contend with and you need to understand. I cannot, as a prominent man in this community, marry off the younger before the older. I just, I can't do it. It will cause chaos. Every father, and by the way, every daughter, is going to be upset with me if I do this because I'm going to set a precedent. And then all of a sudden, can everybody do this? Because that will be ruinous for us as a community. No, 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 no. I had to do this. But here's what I'm willing to do for you. And I've been thinking about this for seven years, so I feel like I've got it dialed in. If you want to have your lawyers look this over, you probably should, but here it is. If you will finish out the wedding week with Leah with a reasonably good attitude, I'm not looking for perfection here, but just fake it. At the end of the week, I will give you Rachel. That's what you want, but here's the catch. You've got to work another seven years. Here's the pen. You in or you out? He's in. He signs the deal. Okay, fine. Which from Jacob's perspective is highly ironic. I mean, if you think about it, under the cloak of his father's darkness because of the blindness, what did Jacob do? He deceived his father into stealing the blessing that should have been conferred upon the, the older brother, and yet it's now here in the dark. He's deceived, and he gets the older sister. He violated all of these conventions to take the birthright and the blessing from his father. And now he's been violated by a convention that says the older must be buried before the younger. Nevertheless, he's not very sympathetic from my perspective, at least not today, even though I love Jacob later in life. The darkness that we're trying to enter into belongs to Leah. And so I just kind of want you to go, man, what was she thinking as she's working through all this stuff? Like, what, what are the aha moments that she's having? What is she realizing and how is that making her feel? Because she had to realize that her father did not care for her. He did not love her. He resented and felt stuck with her. He was about money, not his own girls. He just, he was. 
And he saw them as financial opportunities because in those days, in order to marry someone, you would go to them, again, you would negotiate the deal, and then you would pay a dowry to the family of the bride. You're purchasing her services from that family. You get the idea? They're being compensated for their loss. That's why Jacob, who again doesn't show up with two bags of gold, but he, he does show up with himself, says, look, I don't have the money to pay for you right now. I mean, I've got it back at home and then some, but I'll work for you. So he pays the dowry thinking he's done it for Rachel. He's done it for Leah. Now he's going to do it again. Meanwhile, Laban is super excited about this. He has been able to offload Leah, who has been the barrier between him and his ability to dowry off Rachel. He has this problem. Nobody seems to want to marry Leah. Now I've solved the problem by offloading her onto Jacob, and I get double dowry from this guy who's really, I mean, he's killing it for me by just giving him my second daughter who I want to cash in on anyway. Don't you love this man? It's devastating. My father doesn't love me. My father has felt stuck with me. My father has used me for his own purposes and advantage. She had to realize all of this. And she had to know that she was now married to a man. I mean, seven years earlier, this same guy publicly humiliated her by rejecting her and saying, no, 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 not you, her. He doesn't want her. She's, she's been something he's had to find a way around. He resents the existence of her. He thinks he's found a way around it, but then he gets defrauded into receiving her. So now she has a husband who's never liked her and certainly doesn't now, who's never loved her and likely never will, who never found her attractive and likely never will, and that she has to share for the rest of her life with her sister. Oh, where do I get to sign up for this? And beyond that, she's married now to a man who for whom she would ever and always be little more than a reminder of her father's duplicity. And probably who's a little bit miffed at her. Because like, she could have told him, right? I mean, they got back to the hotel, you know, like she could have said, hey, look, I know it's a little dark in here and you've had a bit to drink, so let me just tell you what's really happening right now. She doesn't do that, and I don't want to overly empower her. Frankly, I think her dad probably came to her. And this is a situation in which the power equation is massively different. Praise the Lord things have changed for women. Really. But I think her dad probably came to her and said, listen, either you go along with this, or you got nowhere to go tomorrow, because you're out. She's stuck. And he, the father, did all of this knowing that he would enrich himself at her expense. And here's her expense. She is now stuck in a marriage to a man that in that day she can't divorce, who doesn't love her, doesn't find her attractive, and for whom she is the object of resentment. Oh, and that she has to share with her sister. So you can imagine Leah laying there on the night of her wedding in the dark of that room, her husband sleeping, just running through this stuff in her head. You could just kind of hear these realities landing in this precious girl's heart. <laughs> Having to reckon with these kinds of things and just freaking out, knowing that as it does every morning, the sun is going to rise the next morning, and when it does, all of this will be brought to light. And yet, as you enter into the darkness of this story, it becomes clear that there is also light, and that it is a darkness, by the way, dispelling kind of light, because even though her father didn't love, for her or love her or value her, even though her husband didn't love her or value her, even though her sister, in all likelihood, didn't love her or value her, certainly didn't want her around, Almighty God loved her, and beyond value, He treasured her. And he demonstrated this in that culture in the most powerful, 
possible way. The primary point of marriage in that culture was having kids. The primary point. What does the Lord do? He closes the womb of Rachel, the younger sister, and he makes the womb of Leah abundantly fruitful. It says in Genesis 29, verse 31, that when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, you know the language? By whom? Everybody. (laughs) Or at least everybody she wanted to be loved by. I'll put it to you that way. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And yet, what does Leah do? She keeps chasing the love of Jacob. She just keeps going out. It's like, if I can't get this man to love me, then I'm never going to experience love. If I can't get this man to value me, then I am of no value. She ties these things to him. It says in Genesis 29, verse 32. So the next verse, it says, And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, which means behold a son. But behold is a word of sight. It means look. You can see it. Look, for she says, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction. She says, I've been seen by God. But then what she doesn't say is, and that's enough for me. I don't need to be seen by anyone else. That frees me from needing to be seen by anyone else. He has seen me. No. She says, the Lord has looked upon my affliction. And now what does she say? For now my husband will love me. Look, as you read through the Bible, as you enter into these kinds of stories, they're inviting you in. They're going, come on, who are you? (laughs) Who do you identify with in this story? They're like, they're inviting you to identify with her. They're inviting you to say, who is it that I am? Frankly, if I'm honest, I may not even be consciously aware of it, but maybe the spirit of the Lord is now going, you know, this is you, right? Like I am living to be seen by fill in the blank. My father, he might not even be alive. My mother, she might not even be alive. My husband, my wife, my ex-husband, my ex-wife, one, two, or three past, like XX, like my boyfriend, my whatever. I actually, you know what? I just want to be seen by somebody, like anybody. I don't even care. I don't discriminate. Someone please see me. Then I'll feel valuable. Jesus is like, really? I see you. And I see it all. And yet I love. And yet I treasure. And yet I value. And yet I live within you. She keeps chasing Jacob. The very next verse, Leah conceived again, we read, and she bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And so she called this name, or his name, Simeon, which simply means heard. She's saying, I've been heard by God. But I want to be heard by my husband. Who do you want to be heard by? Whose ear is it that you think, like, if I just get the ear of this person, if I just get the acknowledgement of this person, if I just get the approval of this person, if I just get recognized by this person, then maybe I matter. And Jesus is like, what about me? Because I hear you. But she keeps chasing Jacob, the verse after that. It says, again, Leah conceived and she bore a son and said what? Now this time my husband will be attached to me. Why? Because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi, which means attached. She's like, I'm attached to God and I'm grateful. But what I really want... And look, it's not like Jacob doesn't know the names of these kids... They're his sons. Now, I think it's telling that he lets her name them. You feel the disdain in that? It's like, you, bear, you have only this utility to me, and then that's it. And honestly, I, you can just name them yourself. So he knows the names. He knows what the names mean. And he knows that that meaning represents the longings of her heart toward him. I want to be seen by you, Jacob. I want to be heard by you, Jacob. I want to be attached to you, Jacob, because then the deepest needs of my heart will be met. Actually, they won't. And it's not coming. 
so there's darkness, but then there's light. And this is where it happens. And like we're not given some sort of a detailed account of how it is that she processed through all of this stuff and finally was awakened sort of like the prodigal son, you know, in the land far, far away, looking for something that he's not going to find there. Then he comes back to the father and finds everything there. She has an awakening experience, and you know that because in verse 35, it says she conceived again and bore a son and said, what? This time I will praise the Lord. No mention of Jacob. Therefore, she called his name Judah, which simply means praise. And by the way, this is the son that puts her in the bloodline of Christ. It's through Judah that the Christ will one day be born, many, many generations later. And then it says that she ceased bearing. And I think she ceased bearing because God was the one who opened her womb, remember? And I think at that point he closed it. Why would he now close it? Because she's gotten the point. And what is the point? It is that the love that you're looking for, the significance that you're looking for, the value that you're looking for, like everything you're looking for is found in him. And it doesn't need to be earned. It doesn't need to be worked for. It's the free gift of God to you. Which is a beautiful thing because when it has to be earned, and that's how it is with people, we got to earn it. I'm, I'm running, running, running. Do you see me? 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 What if I run faster? Now do you see me? Do you hear me? Am I attached? Are we attached? How long do I have to run? Because I'm getting a little bit tired at this point, but nevertheless, I'm just going to keep running. Okay, now, now we're attached. Now you see me. Now I have your ear. Now I'm going to have to keep running to keep this because as soon as I lose it, what do I lose? My worth, my value, any experience of love. Jesus is like, guys, I, I ran the race for you. Here's my love. My eyes on you all the time. Everything you think and hear, or everything you think and speak, I hear. They are the free gift of grace from the one who did not just work seven years that he might have you for himself, but who left heaven through a supernatural conception. He clothed himself in our flesh and blood, in our humanity. He stepped into this world as one of us on Christmas, a day of breakthrough kind of light. And then he lived an entire life for you, a life like no other life that has ever been lived in that it was perfect before God. And then he took his infinitely valuable God-made man and perfectly righteous life, and he laid it down as a substitute for you to cover over all of your imperfections, to remove everything that stands between you and the Lord so that by his performance alone, faith in him, you might receive the gift of forgiveness and wholeness of welcome into the family of God as a son or daughter of the king. You might be filled by his spirit and come to know what it means to actually live. But other than that, it's amazing Jacob could only love that which is beautiful. Jesus loves us even though we're not beautiful. And I'm not talking about on the outside. I'm talking about where it matters in here. And here's what his love does. It makes us beautiful. It's transformational. So all that to say, you know, stop trying to win the approval of some parent who, you know, maybe at this point in the game, you, if you're doing the math, might not be going to give it to you. You know, you're like, it's not coming. And even if it does, it doesn't make you more or less lovable or more or less valuable. What establishes that is what God has done for you and the price tag that he's put and then paid for you. That's love and value. And it frees you from having to prove yourself to someone. I mean, some of us, and you know, we don't do this consciously, but some of us are so driven through life because we're trying to prove something to a parent who's, who might be dead and gone. But we're still trying to gain what? To gain what they can't give you and couldn't even when they were alive, but that is freely gifted to you in Jesus. Stop. Be free of that. Stop trying to, to gain your worth and, and all of the love that your heart needs from someone that you're married to or maybe that you used to be married to. It's not fair. It's not fair to them. They're not equipped to do that for you. That's not to say they aren't commanded to love you or that they don't love you. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying marriage isn't a wonderful gift and a source of great satisfaction. It's all of those things in spades. But man, that's a load of pressure right there. So I'm gonna, I've got to meet the deepest longings of your heart because 
That feels like a lot to me. And I'm a doer. It's not fair to them. It's not fair to you. And Jesus is like, you know, I got this, right? Like, I mean, I'm, that's what I do. Stop looking to find your value in other, other people's opinions about your kids and how perfect they are or aren't. Valuation is going up and down every day, right? About your looks. Sorry, they're fading eventually. I mean, they just, they will. Talk about a treadmill, you know, like literally, you know. About your grades, if you're a student, you find your identity in that, your work or your net worth or whatever. It's easy, I think, to identify with the darkness of Leah. She's a person where people And I think what Jesus is doing, and this is what I want you to see, is he's inviting you out of that. And he's going, yeah, yeah, no, you don't need to do that. It's like he's standing here going, have you had enough yet? Have you been disappointed enough yet? Have you gone empty long enough yet? Okay, come on then. I got this. I'm here for you. So I close with just two questions. And first is, who or what are you looking to for love and acceptance and significance and value because if it's anything or anyone other than Jesus, it's like chasing the wind, man. It's, it's, I don't know if you've tried to do that, but probably not, right? You just run and you grab it. What do you come up with? Nothing. At some point, you go, that's unreasonable. I guess that doesn't even make sense. I mean, it's illogical. I can't. Find that in Christ, and then that's really the second question. Will you accept Jesus' invitation to find satisfaction for the deepest longings of your heart and soul in him? Because he sees you, and he hears you, and he has done everything necessary to eternally attach himself to you. If you'll have him. So there it is. Think about this as you prepare your heart for this table. And let's pray and ask the Lord to help us to do exactly that. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the story of this precious, amazing girl named Leah. This story full of difficulty and darkness that gives way to light and life and even joy. This story of pain that is being redeemed even now, thousands of years later, as it calls out the darkness in each one of us, and as it invites us into the light. And so, Lord, let us hear the invitation. You know, by your Spirit, give us the courage to be honest with you about ourselves, and frankly, honest with our own selves about ourselves, and what it is that we're looking to for love and significance and value and all those things. How exhausted perhaps we are for all the running and all of the chasing. How disappointed or embittered we've become of the failure to find what we're looking for. And turn our hearts and turn our minds toward you. And let us find in you the lover of our souls. Let us collapse into the arms that do not fail. Let us know your embrace as we come to your table, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.